for Friday morning with us. Um, my name is Ling Becker. I'm the workforce director here in Ramsey County, and I am just so honored to be your MC this morning. Um, these next couple hours, I think, will go really fast because we have a lot of exciting and interesting information. And I definitely want to thank you for your commitment to our community by being here. I know a lot of you work with job seekers. Many of you are educators. You're committed to uh, growing a more inclusive economy in Ramsey County. And so it's just really awesome to have you here. And I wanna give a special shout out. I saw that the White Bear Lake Schools has their environmental club here. So great to have you guys here as students caring about our community and caring about our environment and also um, understanding how this can be a great career path for a, a, a great career and great future for all of us. So. Um, I'm also the executive director of the Workforce Board, and uh, they're one of the co-sponsors here today as well. And so I see some of our Workforce Board members, and you'll be hearing from Bob Blake in a, uh, at some point during this meeting as well in a moment. So um, we are hosting this event today because there is so much happening in green jobs right now in Ramsey County and in the city of St. Paul. And we want to both share insights into this slice of the economy and also to give you some inspiration as you help people to think about the numerous careers that are out there and looking to build um, our workforce. I wanna thank especially, um, I mentioned our workforce board is one of the partners, but also wanna thank the city of St. Paul and also the St. Paul Chamber for their partnership in helping us uh, host this event today. Um, we wanna start this morning by reflecting for a moment about this place where we all live and why it's so important to keep moving forward in ways that allow us to be responsible stewards of our environment. Um, as a part of our workforce board this past um, year, um, or 18 months actually, we've, we've begun reading a land acknowledgement as a part of all our meetings. And this is, happens at our full board meeting as well as all our committee meetings. So today I'd like to start us here and I've invited Sheila Olson, who's the Chief Programs and Services Officer for Goodwill Easter Seals and also a member of our workforce board to uh, read that acknowledgement for us this morning. Sheila? Thanks, Ling. Morning, everybody. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land since. Time immemorable. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We are standing on ancestral lands of the Dakota people. We want to acknowledge the Ojibwe, the Ho-Chunk, the other nations of people who are also called, who have also called this place home. We pay respects to their elders past and present, take a moment to consider the treaties made by tribal nations that entitle or entitle non-native people to live and work on traditional native lands. Consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you, Sheila, for reading that for us. Um, so um, again, back to um, kind of the purpose of today. Just really want you to take a moment to think about why you're here today. Um, there might be particular job seekers that you're hoping to equip with new pathways. Maybe you're looking to be on the cutting edge of things. Maybe you're here because you care deeply like so many Minnesotans about the environment around us and how we can help nature to keep thriving for generations to come. Maybe it's all of that. Feel free to share in the chat your reasons for being here and what you hope for today as we um, dive in. So in a moment, we'll kick things off to hear from some leaders in Ramsey County. Um, then you will hear from business leaders who will share why they're investing in green jobs and where they see this piece of our economy going. We're gonna have two panels this morning featuring both business leaders and leaders from the trades who will explore the many pathways to these careers. And finally, I'll close this out with um, some data points and resources. 
From 11 to 11.30, you're gonna be welcome to stay on, to connect with one another, to ask questions if you'd like. So with that, let's start. This morning, I am very um, pleased to be able to introduce um, Commissioner Jim McDonough. Commissioner McDonough was born and raised on the east side in St. Paul and continues to live there today. Being a lifelong resident um, has given him a unique understanding of the qualities that his neighborhood embodies, including a strong dedication to our community and to the importance of building relationships. He has a strong commitment to our workforce and has been our, um, our lead commissioner in our workforce development area um, for many years. And he has served on many boards at uh, state, federal levels, and represents the east side extremely well. So thank you, Commissioner, for being here, and we'd love for you to say a few words for us this morning. Uh, thanks, Ling. First off, I want to thank all the, all, all the partners who helped put this together. The timing for this is, 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 is perfect. Um, you know, right now, there's way more jobs than there are applicants, and in many of the green jobs fields. And so the timing on this is perfect. Glad to see such a great attendance here. And I wanna thank everybody for attending the event. Ramsey County is pleased to partner with the city of St. Paul, the St. Paul Area Chamber and the Ramsey County Workforce Innovation Board to host this event today. We appreciate so many partners joining us today. For those of you who work with job seekers in Ramsey County, thank you for your work. Our goals in the county include prosperity and opportunity. As we look into the future of the East Side, St. Paul and Ramsey County, we see the tremendous impact that green careers will have on our economy. We want to ensure our residents are well positioned to be able to leverage job opportunities. The infrastructure bill has put a high priority on green construction and we are seeing more and more local projects that put climate resiliency as an important driving factor. We are excited about the future of jobs in our community and appreciate so many partners who work with us to ensure we are creating a more inclusive economy for all. And I'm gonna end with just a little personal story. Uh, I graduated from Johnson High School on the east side here in 1973 went to work for Whirlpool at the time, which was a major employer on the east side, over 2,500 jobs that helped support people that lived on the east side. <clears throat> at the same time, we had hams and we had 3M. Between the three of them, we had over 6,000 jobs on the east side where you did not need a college education. You could go right to work, you could get benefits, you were earning the pension credits. Um, all those jobs are gone, not only on the east side, but in so many parts of our community as we've transitioned. I was fortunate enough to get an apprenticeship into the Glazers Trade uh, Union in 1976. And for some of you, and I know I, I see many of my trades friends, you guys know what Glazers are, but a lot of people ask the first thing, what is a Glazer? What are you doing? And it's got nothing to do with donuts, let me tell you. But I hear that a lot. But we do the glass, we do beers, we do all those storefronts you see in malls, anything connected to glass. And for 30 years, I worked in that trade in the field and it put food on the table, a roof over my head, helped me raise four children, educate those kids in college. College was right for all of them, but college isn't right for everybody. And the building trades are an amazing opportunity. You're gonna hear from some of the trades, but the evolution in the building trades and how we construct our buildings, the materials we use, the way we do our installations, and, and just as important, the way we demo our buildings now are so much different than in the 70s and 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s, and really have that environmental lens. So thanks to everybody for being here. It's been my honor to say a few words as we open this up and, and uh, have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. We really appreciate your leadership and your support in our workforce efforts. It's um, he is somebody who shows up and um, understands the issues and really cares about uh, particularly the young people in our community and really focused on the future of our community. So thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate all your support. Um, next, I, I'm really excited to introduce another colleague of mine that I've had the chance to work with um, over the last couple of years. Um, I, Russ Stark, he's the Chief Resiliency, Resilience Officer for St. Paul Mayor uh, Carter's office. Uh, Russ served 10 years on the St. Paul City Council. Prior to his public service, he's worked at nonprofits focused on community development, 
uh, environmental advocacy and improved transportation options, including early planning for what is now the Green Line, which we all appreciate in our community so much. Um, I just want to personally honor you, Russ, for the innovation and the thought leadership that and partnership that you provide to me. And I've really just thoroughly enjoyed working with you over the last couple of years. So today, Russ is going to share some updates about what's happening in the city. Um, and so thank you, Russ. We look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you, Ling. It's uh, great to be with you. I am here in person at a conference, and so I'm going to stay masked. Uh, so forgive the, uh, the half a face here. But uh, Commissioner, it's great to see you. Thanks for all of your work and commitment on these issues uh, these many years. And Ling, I couldn't imagine a better partner in this work at the county. Um, I am going to share my screen here. Oh, saying that that's disabled at the moment. Um, so I do work for Mayor Melvin Carter, directing the city's uh, work in climate and sustainability. Um, and uh, that work involves uh, a workforce component. But uh, as we all know, uh, a lot of the focus in this realm these days is around this issue of climate change. Uh, climate change is affecting all of us, uh, wherever we live uh, across the globe. Uh, and if I can share, I'm not, oh, here we go. Um, now we're moving. Um, here's an image just from a few years ago in St. Paul of the flooding along the river uh, near downtown, which in 2019 was the longest uh, sustained flood we've seen on the Mississippi uh, in, in the city's history. You know, it shut down, it shuts down some roads, it affects park space, there was about $4 million uh, in damage uh, in the city of St. Paul, um, clearly a symptom of the changing uh, climate in our community. Another example, the the rock slide that happened a couple of years back um, that dumped uh, a tremendous amount of limestone onto Wabasha Street on the west side. As Mayor Carter often recounts, uh, luckily no one was injured when this, when this rock slide occurred. If it had been one week later, it would have been during the Cinco de Mayo parade happening right at this location. Um, in my work, we're really going after uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions across the city of St. Paul. And to do that, you have to know where those emissions are coming from. And what we know is that most of the greenhouse gases that we create as a community come from the energy we use in buildings and the energy we use in transportation. And so a ton of our work is focused on those two sectors and really moving to a clean energy system uh, for both buildings and transportation. And of course, that has implications for workforce and jobs. And our um, city goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions down to zero by 2050, and probably the more aggressive goal, which is a 50% reduction by 2030, are really gonna drive the need for a lot of change and action on the ground. What does that change and action look like? Well, it's investments in clean energy, uh, like solar. Uh, here's a, a rooftop installation. Uh, it means insulating, better insulating our buildings, air sealing, uh, and a lot of our homes in St. Paul, believe it or not, have uninsulated walls. Uh, we know that as many as 30 or 40 percent do, uh, and that's a really big opportunity to um, create some jobs, uh, invest in our housing stock, and make those homes a lot more energy efficient and comfortable for our residents. There are some large projects happening, of course, in the city of St. Paul. And one of those, probably the biggest right now, is what we call Highland Bridge down at the former Ford site uh, in the Highland Park neighborhood. Here's an image from, oh, about five weeks ago now that I took of the progress. This is the central stormwater feature down at Highland Bridge. And the variety of uh, jobs and the trades uh, to do this work of building out uh, new infrastructure around stormwater, public infrastructure around streets, the new buildings that are gonna go up there. The buildings that are gonna be, that are starting to come out of the ground at Highland Bridge will be the most uh, sustainable buildings that we've ever seen in St. Paul. They're having to meet the city's sustainable building ordinance standards. Uh, so they'll be more efficient, they'll be more insulated. Uh, there's gonna be 
uh, a substantial uh, solar array uh, installed next door. And those are just some of the examples of the ways in which city policy and goals around energy and climate are going to are creating jobs today and are going to continue to um, for the coming months and years. Here you see an investment from several years ago. This is Jackson Street in downtown St. Paul and the Capital City Bikeway. Um, and this one shot shows you a lot of different pieces of infrastructure that had to come into play um, for this massive project to reconstruct this street. Um, and just a, a wide variety of uh, different trades uh, had to be involved in this work. You can see uh, innovative stormwater solution. It's literally capturing the runoff from the street and infiltrating it into the ground so it doesn't run directly into the river. That's a pervious uh, asphalt on the trail itself. Uh, new signals, new sidewalks, um, and uh, all the underground infrastructure as well had to be replaced. So these are the these are some examples of projects that are really uh, creating jobs in St. Paul and where we have opportunities to think about ways to get more of our St. Paul residents, particularly those who have had barriers to access to these jobs in the past into these opportunities. As Mayor Carter uh, has recounted uh, many times to me, his, his vision is to, is to drive by or walk by some of these construction sites in the city and to see the folks working on those sites really reflect uh, the St. Paul community. And I'll close with uh, another great example, and this is under construction right now around town. We are in the midst of installing 38 of these EV charging stations around St. Paul uh, right now, uh, working with local contractors, um, as well as an investment in this new electric vehicle car share called EV. And that program is going to be a 170 vehicles available for people to move around our community uh, using clean energy um, and a, a no emission vehicle. And that's creating jobs actually with our nonprofit partner, Our Car, who's having to hire people to manage this fleet and to manage uh, this uh, greatly expanded program. So just a few examples of the, of the kinds of things that the city is doing that are driving both innovation and uh, new work opportunities in this space. And finally, um, we just kicked off a new initiative that is really in its infancy, but we uh, are going to expand upon with the help of Ling and her team and our new committee at the Workforce Innovation Board. But this was um, a graduation that happened just a couple of weeks ago, a partnership with many of the partners that you see here on the slide um, with uh, local nonprofit Ujamaa Place, really at the center of it. And these four individuals with the certificates completed um, the MC3 program, which is an overview of the construction trades. Um, and uh, are a couple of steps closer to being ready to enter some type of apprenticeship. And so we're really excited about that as well. I'll close there and just say thank you to all of you for being here today, for engaging in this conversation, uh, and especially to Ling and her team. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of um, opportunity that's coming. Uh, but between the federal infrastructure bill and now what looks like the Build Back Better package that's going to get passed here in the next couple of days, uh, we're going to have a lot of work to do in St. Paul and Ramsey County in this area of green jobs, and we look forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Appreciate um, just that great presentation and the excitement in St. Paul around so much opportunity. And, and Russ is absolutely right. We are going to see a probably a once in a generation um, opportunity with dollars investing in new places that we haven't seen before. And I think the, the true challenge for all of us is to think about how we um, ensure that we, we build that work inclusively, right? And that no one's left on the sidelines as we do that work. And that's gonna be a, a, re a real challenge for us, but uh, one that I think our community is really up for. And I know um, the city and the county uh, leadership is very committed to that. So thanks, Russ. Appreciate that. Um, next, you guys are all in for a real treat. Um, one of my uh, great colleagues um, over on the Workforce Board, Bob Blake, is going to share a little bit of, with you. Um, Bob has a, a just a wonderful um, background. Um, he is an incredible person who has devoted so much time to these issues personally and professionally. He's a tribal citizen of the Red 
Lake Band of Ojibwe Indians. He serves on our governor's workforce board. He serves on our Ramsey County workforce board. And he is our uh, idea person, our, our, our energy, our passion. I mean, when you get down with a meeting with Bob, you're just excited about this topic. So he's the perfect person to talk to you today. He is the founder and CEO of Solar Bear, a full service solar installation company, and also the executive director of the Native Sun Community Power Development. And so, Bob, I just want to thank you for just um, your commitment to this work and, and your desire to really bring all of us um, into the fold of understanding how we can use this for the good of our community and to really build opportunity for all. So I commend you for that and thank you for sharing with us this morning. Oh, thank you, Ling. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ramsey County Workforce Innovation Board. Um, and, you know, uh, the city of St. Paul, Russ Stark, the great, the great work that man has done. Um, I'm so inspired by him every time that I, I get to work with him too. And so it, it's just, it's just so much, uh, it, so much inspiration there. And, um, you know, I, everyone, I, the reason why I do this work, I, I mean, I grew up here. I've lived in St. Paul my whole life. Um, I went to St. Bernard's on Rice Street uh, from kindergarten to eighth grade, played baseball up on Rice Street, um, you know, played ball on the east side for the LES, uh, Lower East Side. Um, you know, uh, all my buddies played hockey at Johnson. I think Jim McDonough told uh, about his Johnson story. Those are all my buddies that played hockey there, went to the state tournament, and um, I ended up going to St. Paul Central. Um, and, and um, you know, and, and so... You know, just being just a St. Paul guy, I love St. Paul and I love this community. And I've seen St. Paul go through so many changes. And the one thing um, that I got really concerned about um, and was just this knowledge that I got from working in the and working around environmental justice and working with the climate, um, with the climate, with, with the climate uh, uh, mitigation, adaptation. In, 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 in those, in, in those uh, resiliency strategies. And I just thought to myself, we got to prepare St. Paul. We've got to get to work. We've got to prepare our community for what's coming. And um, that was the reason why I ran for city council a couple years ago, because I really felt so strongly about uh, preparing this community. And voila, I got to get on a couple of boards and, and, and help voice my opinion. So thank you for that, Mayor Carter, for, uh, for, for nominating for that. So that's a, that was a true honor. But uh, in short, everyone, I, I just want to tell everyone that, you know, I'm a St. Paul guy. I, I am from Red Lake, um, but I grew up here my entire life and just uh, and just love this community. And um, the thing about it is that we are going to have uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity here. Uh, as Russ mentioned, you know, you've got the Highland Bridge, you've got the Rondo Connect, you've got the uh, you've got the, uh, the, the the golf course uh, up on the east side. Um, you know, you've, you've got some major projects that are going to be happening here, and we could put the, the people in St. Paul to work. I mean, all my buddies are in the trades, and, and you know, I, one thing that every trades guy knows, and it's that feeling. It's that feeling when you walk past a job site that you worked on one time in your life, and you can remember, like, what it was like to, like, walk in the back door, up the back way, you know, onto the roof. You know, you, you remember all those things and, and the trades guys can all tell you, they, they'll, they'll, they, they could tell you precisely how that, how they put that project together. And, and, and that's the feeling that I'm talking about. It's that feeling that you're a part of something bigger than yourselves. And, and, and it's that feeling that, that really excites me for, for everybody, for, 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 for residents of St. Paul to be a part of this change, to be a part of this green uh, initiative to build St. Paul, that you're going to be a part of this, building our community to be more resilient, uh, to, to, to be able to handle the climate change impacts, and to be a part of this once in a lifetime opportunity. And so that's what's really exciting. And I know the trades guys, I, I you know, we'll, we'll be driving somewhere and, and they'll look over the right and say, hey, I, I worked on that project. I worked on that project. I know my, my cousin, you know, talks to his, his, his son and he says, hey, hey, I, I did that right when I did that building over there. I did that building over there. And so that to me is really exciting, guys. And that's the, and that's the kind of uh, experience that all of you today that are watching um, are going to be able to be a part of. And, and, and uh, we are going to hear from three great speakers that are in the energy industry and that are doing fabulous work. 
And so I'm really excited, everyone, for all of you to be involved and um, go, go St. Paul and go Ramsey County and let's build a better future and a greener future for all of us. Uh, thank you and miigwech, everyone. Thanks, Bob. All right, well, obviously Bob drank his coffee today because he <laughs> he's up and at, he's like that all the time, actually. So I don't think it's the coffee, it's just his passion. So thank you, Bob, appreciate you. Um, so next, um, you know, so who utilizes like these new technologies that we're kind of alluding to? I know we have to kind of dig deeper here today. So we wanted to, before we did our panel, to share a story of one company and their experience and the types of roles that it involved um, in the green space. So the folks from Vamela Solar Farm Project are here to offer us a case study. So I'm happy to introduce Lou Rayola. Uh, who's Vomela's director of ESG. In this role, Lou leads the corporate social responsibility and public affairs for the company, both here and at their headquarters uh, in St. Paul and across 22 other markets. Lou is a native East Sider too. So you guys are kind of hearing a theme here this morning and a graduate of St. Paul Johnson as well. So uh, we'll, we'll double down on that one. Lou is a nationally recognized leader of social impact. We're excited to have him here. Uh, joining Lou is going to be Eric Passy, co-owner and chief development officer of IPS Solar. Eric has uh, helped organizations analyze and adopt uh, clean energy strategies nationwide. In 2020, he released his first book, Clean Wave, A Guide to Success in Green Recovery, which is an awesome book that I personally am reading. And so thank you, Eric. And Eric um, took me on a visit to the top of a target and we got to see some solar panels and installation and see some workers and it was you know those are the kind of experiences that we need all of you to have too so you can actually see see the work in action so um, I know Lou and Eric have a presentation prepared for us so I'm going to turn it over to them thanks thank welcome you. yeah thank you Ling uh, and good morning everyone uh, wow as I'm sitting here listening in I, I'm finding myself maybe in a challenging position following uh, Bob, holy cow, Bob Blake, you are one impressive individual. And then I'm, I'm bookend with Eric as an author. So, um, you know, big, big, big shoes to fill here in, uh, in the middle of, uh, of the two. So uh, applaud what everyone is doing. Great to be with everyone on behalf of the Vomella companies. Um, I'm, I'm going to be very brief because the real meat of this uh, presentation is what Eric is going to share with you. But I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, if on behalf of the Vomella companies, we're really proud to have our headquarters on the east side of, of St. Paul. Um, I am going to screen share and just share a, a brief introduction to Vomella for those of you that are not familiar with the organization. Uh, bear with me a moment. Uh, Ling, is it showing? Great, thank you. Uh, always a little bit challenged uh, making sure on the technology transfer over. So. Um, for those of you not familiar with, uh, with Vomella, uh, we are a company uh, that is comprised of multiple entities uh, represented across various different cities. Um, we are what would be typically called a, a, a printer. Um, uh, this is a shot of our headquarters internal. You're going to be seeing some of the external uh, from Eric here in a moment, but we work primarily with very large corporations uh, that are looking to transform their various different experiences, um, be they retail stores, uh, the medical facilities, uh, we have a very large fleet business and a host of other industries that we support. So think of graphic communications uh, as a um, uh, visual communications as a, a major part of our business. But what you might not know about Vomella is that we are very committed to sustainability. Um, our purpose uh, statement is, you know, we are, we're, uh, we're, our purpose is to unite and inspire others by what is possible. And that includes our work on the sustainability side. Um, we are uh, not only going to be sharing with you today our solar array, but some of the things we're doing internally. We are what is called a sustainable green printer uh, which is a certification that we went through, a lot of rigor, uh, looking and evaluating and auditing the types of systems, processes, and policies that we have in place. We have an amazing innovation team that is working on a number of different uh, innovations around the use of raw materials. Think of uh, stores that you go into and you see signage that's printed on plastic. 
that ends up in a landfill. And so we are working very hard to innovate new solutions that we can bring to our corporate partners to help them meet their goals uh, around sustainability and what we call ESG. Uh, we're working very heavily in our waste streams. We measure our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so while we're in a, an industry that emits a, a lot of waste and uh, consumes a lot of energy, it's really great to work with an organization and have the leadership so committed to, um, to really being a, a, a change agent um, in the business and an industry leader. And so with that, um, again, I just wanted to give you a quick you know, overview of, of the Vomella companies, our commitment uh, to sustainability, and probably the best example that uh, we can share of that commitment is what I'm going to uh, now turn over to Eric to share with you about our solar array. So thanks for having me, Ling, and, and Eric, it's all yours. Thanks, Lou. Uh, and good morning, everybody. My name is Eric Posse. I'm the Chief Development Officer of IPS Solar. I am uh, was born in Hawaii, but grew up on the east side. Um, I went to Harding High School, so I won't hold that against either Lou or uh, Commissioner McDonough this morning, but I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I just have a few slides to share about the project uh, that, that Lou had mentioned. I joined IPS in 2007, so I've been, uh, I'm approaching 15 years in the solar industry, which is uh, almost two lifetimes. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, technology has, has advanced very quickly in the space. Um, I went to college at the University of Minnesota and then um, was very inspired by the climate movement um, early stages, I guess, or mid stages at that time, and looked for uh, all, any and all um, renewable energy companies because I knew that that was going to be the future. I'd done some research at that time and found that um, solar and wind were both on a 40% year over year growth clip. I went to school for business and started in sales uh, and, and kind of have continued on that trajectory and I'm the chief development officer at, I, at IPS. I, um, this project in particular, I'm very proud of. Um, as Lou mentioned, this is uh, right on, on the east side, in the heart of the east side, uh, near Arcade and Payne Avenue. And I, I grew up closer to White Bear Avenue. Um, but I'm very proud that this uh, was the largest, and still is, I believe, the largest rooftop commercial solar project and even um, just solar project in general in the city. And um, it started with the St. Paul Port Authority and the redevelopment of this property alongside Vomella. Uh, St. Paul Port Authority introduced me to uh, Mark Off, who's, who's the president of the organization. And we had a discussion about, you know, what opportunities there might be to offset a significant portion of their energy usage. You can see here from the aerial view um, that uh, it's quite substantial. We're not using all of the roof space and that's uh, due to some limitations that Excel has on, on solar projects uh, in the city, but still a substantial portion of that roof, about 150,000 square feet of that roof is covered with solar panels. Um, as you can see, 3,408. Uh, and this uh, and this array is enough to power roughly 130 average homes in in the city. And I'm very happy that um, you know we're making the east side a little bit greener with this project, um, offsetting nearly 3,600 36,000 tons of CO2, um, which is equivalent to adding about 44,000 acres of trees um, over the lifetime of this of the system. Um, so I will, uh, can we uh, proceed to the next slide, please? We'll see how it, well this does here. Um, a, uh, a video, a uh, quick video tour for, for you all. So, um, we, uh, we pardon the INS music. Uh, either that might have been me. Um, you can see that, um, we, uh, we found the system, um, really the line against these types of installations. You can mute that if you'd like. There we go. Um, the, uh, the design of these installations really is to, to meld and, and inter, um, interface with the roof in a way that is non, um, uh, that doesn't adversely affect the structure. And so we work with structural and every, everyone from structural engineers to 
um, to designers, to electrical engineering. Uh, we worked very diligently with the existing uh, construction team that built, built the facility. And so when we talk about green jobs, it's really everything from me as a business development person through to um, the actual construction uh, side of, of the business, which uh, you know, utilizes uh, both electricians as well as other, other laborers and, um, and everything in between. So when we think about green jobs, it really isn't just kind of a monolithic um, you know, uh, electricians and, and solar installers, but it's also the secondary aspect of our business, which includes um, uh, accounting and uh, HR and finance and the kind of the suite of, of business in between. Um, and so while um, most folks you know, kind of think of solar installers, there's, there's definitely opportunities abound beyond, um, beyond that uh, in our field. Um, and so really kind of from our perspective, we, um, uh, we're, we're, we're growing tremendously. I, I think I, uh, we were down uh, to about three employees at one time. Uh, we've since uh, grown to over uh, 40 uh, currently and are hiring uh, additional uh, staff at this, at this point. And in 2018, we're recognized by the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal as the fastest growing company in the city, uh, second uh, in the cities, second fastest in the state. Um, and so we, we, this, our story is not unique. We're, we're seeing this across the board in clean energy and we're excited to be, um, you know, not only a part of the environmental solution, but also the economic solution and um, are, are happily headquartered in, in Roseville uh, in Ramsey County. Um, next slide, please. So with that, um, I'm happy to be joining the next panel here uh, and, and discussing with some of my other colleagues in the space. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Ling, and um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity here to share, share the story. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And thank you, Lou. This is an amazing demonstration of um, just the opportunity that sits before us. I mean, you know, you, you think about something like this and you as you drive through our communities and look at rooftops or think about how large they are. I mean, there, there's so much opportunity to both save money and create jobs and create a better world. So this is the kind of thing that we're, we're, we're really kind of honing in on. And I think Eric hit on a really great point that, um, and I tend to do this too. Sometimes when you think about industries, your mind immediately goes to certain types of jobs, but there's so many other jobs that are like a part of the success of, of those industries, right? That, that transcend that. And and I think it is um, through COVID, we've seen that, for example, that you know, tech jobs are everybody's job, right? Like everyone's got tech people in their, in their jobs. Everyone's got finance people. Everyone's got you know, uh, business analysts, you know, whatever those are. I mean, they're, they're, all part, they're all part of an intricate network and yet you can work in an industry that is fast growing and, and, and really woven into you know, the future of our community as, as, as policymakers are making and gover federal government is making large investments, right? And how do we align all those puzzle pieces in a way that also then layers in really our county values of opportunity and prosperity that Commissioner McDonough talked about as well. And that's why it's so great. You guys are gonna get to meet Rachel back here in a little bit after our panel, but you know, the Eastside Employment Exchange, you know, we have so many partners in Ramsey County and we don't do this work alone. And, and that's what's gonna be the key to our success here. So, um, so, okay, without further ado, we're gonna go to the panel. Eric, thank you for being on the panel. I'm also gonna um, involve two other people to um, help us have a conversation. So Nick Martin um, is the Policy and Outreach Manager for Excel Energy. Thanks, Nick, for being with us today. Nick advises on state and local clean energy policy, helps prepare integrated resource plans, works with communities on resiliency, clean energy, with large businesses on sustainability strategies, and helps to design new strategies around renewable energy. So thank you for being here. He's on many boards, including the Minnesota Environmental Quality Board, the St. Paul Climate Justice Advisory Board, and also um, the Board of Directors of the Environmental Initiative. So um, certainly one of those leaders in our community that we're excited to be able to have access to and be able to tap as somebody that we can work with as, as, as the county. 
And then um, our last panelist is gonna be Sarah Weeby. She is the solar power consultant with All Energy Solar. She has worked for All Energy Solar for seven years and has helped hundreds of residential, commercial and agricultural clients throughout Minnesota, Wisconsin and Iowa. She's currently serving a three-year term, board term on the Minnesota Solar Energy Industries Association. And she serves as the secretary, but also the chair of the Equity and Diversity Inclusion Committee. So thank you to all three of you for being here. And it's a great opportunity for us to um, hear from you as business leaders who are working in green construction. This is an area that obviously we've been talking about job growth and opportunity based on the comments from this morning. So um, could you just each please tell us a little more about kind of your role within your organization? I know we heard from you, Eric, a little bit, but maybe Sarah and um, Eric, each of you, um, Nick, um, could maybe just elaborate a little more about what you do. That would be wonderful. Sarah, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Webby. Um, I am also a St. Paul native. Um, I right, currently live in the Summit University neighborhood, um, right on the St. Paul Green Line, actually. Um, I own a home on University in Victoria and love it here. Um, and have, um, like was shared earlier, worked for All Energy Solar for the last seven years. And um, it's been quite an experience. All energy has. Oh, you went on mute, Sarah. Sorry, my oh, hit my mouse. <laughs> we um, have been based in St. Paul. Um, our current office is on um, Energy Park Drive in um, one of the St. Paul Port, Port Authority's um, projects. And we have, um, in my experience on the sales team, um, then definitely a customer facing, public facing um, force for solar. And so a part of my job has always been to educate people. Um, you know, there's a lot of technical training that goes into that, um, a lot of ethical training that goes into that. Um, and um, then, you know, through uh, experiences working with customers and supporting their ability to make their own energy choices. Um, I've come to learn quite a lot about the system that we're working inside of um, in terms of the current regulatory and policy environment um, and serve on um, All Energy Solar's policy team and now um, work um, as well uh, with Mencia on the board of directors. Um, and ultimately, um, I think my experience has um, been broad in the sense that I have met so many people and seen so many different opinions about how energy, how the clean energy future is gonna pl play out. Um, so hoping to bring that into the conversation here. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, Nick, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about, I know I gave a lot of bio stuff, but I kinda of wanna know what your passions are around your role and what you do at Excel and what drives you every day, so. Sure, thanks, thanks, Ling. Thanks for being, uh, the invitation. And I wanted to also thank my colleague on the Climate Justice Advisory Board, Bob Black, for inviting me to be part of this. I, I love Bob's enthusiasm and I love all the, the enthusiasm for St. Paul that we're hearing. I was born here in St. Paul, I grew up in another part of the Midwest, but I came back here about 15 years ago and live in Mack Groveland. Um, and I'm just also super excited about all the opportunity, I think that clean energy, broadly speaking, offers for St. Paul to, to grow and, and um, create sort of equitable um, economic um, growth in, in Minnesota and in St. Paul, Ramsey County specifically. Um, I, uh, my, um, role at Excel. For a lot of the time I've been at Excel, really all my career I've gotten to work on climate change in one way or another. And a lot of the time I've been at Excel, I've been involved in um, policy, you know, around decarbonization. So, you know, really trying to, um, Excel has, has, has really um, announced pretty ag aggressive goals around decarbonization of electricity decarbonization of transportation around the EV programs we're putting, put, putting out, and most recently a goal around decarbonization of natural gas use in, in buildings and the other ways that natural gas is used in, in Minnesota. And um, a lot of the time that I've been at Excel, I, I've, I've gotten to be very directly involved either in sort of 
you know, uh, setting out those goals, looking at strategy, figuring out what's achievable, um, or doing things like integrated resource planning, which is really the way utilities, um, you know, sort of lay out a roadmap for, um, for, for the, the long-term growth of the energy system. And one of the things that's most exciting about that is, you know, renewable energy is by far the biggest growth area for Excel and in our integrated resource plans. The, the integrated resource plan that we have in front of the commission now proposes about 6,000 megawatts of new wind and solar on top of a whole lot of wind that, that we've brought onto the system. Uh, solar is the biggest growth area as coal is going off of the system. A lot of that is being replaced by, by renewables. Also really exciting developments in energy storage, electrification, as I said, a lot of um, opportunity to, uh, to electrify parts of the economy because the, the electric sector is decarbonizing faster than most other sectors. So to the extent that we can accelerate um, getting EVs on the road and even electrifying building heating, um, that it's gonna help drive decarbonization in those sectors. So uh, it's really exciting. I've gotten to work on a lot of that for Excel um, recently. And I just wanted to say one other thing, um, recently my, uh, my role at Excel, I've, I've gone into another group, which is community relations. And that's giving, even though I was working before on kind of all the strategy and policy issues, um, I really love my current role because it's giving me much more opportunity to kind of work directly with some of our communities whether that's like cities like St. Paul and others or, um, you, you know, uh, initiatives that we're working on to sort of partner with different BIPOC-led organizations around equity and clean energy uh, and uh, workforce development. So that's a, a wonderful part of my, my, my current role. Yeah, that's, well, thank you, Nick. Um, we're going to get to workforce development just in a moment, but um, I would like to hear, you know, just because we got to just see kind of a high level overview, just stay there for just one, a little bit longer, Eric. I mean, what, what are the things that excite you about the industry? Like what's happening that you think, we have a bunch of people that are educators that work with workforce professionals. We have the environmental club of White Bear Lake on the line. Like what, 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 what excites you that should excite them as they think about how they could lean into this industry as a career? When you talk about clean technology, I might get as uh, enthusiastic as Bob uh, is the general about clean energy jobs. So I am so excited about the future of the space. Uh, again, I've been I've had a kind of front uh, row view for the last 15 years, and just as um, everything that Nick uh, and Nicholas had said, we are seeing a dramatic transformation in the energy sector. Um, at a pace that I would not have imagined, like even as recent as five or, or, or seven years ago. So um, electrification of the energy sector um, of, that includes transportation and uh, heating um, is gonna dr drastically change like how we live and, and how we get, uh, how we, uh, get around um, and, and how our business businesses and economy uh, operate. So, um, you know, I am uh, very uh, pro, um, uh, our business has been very involved in the community solar space. I think that is another big trend that we're starting to see, which is essentially the democratization of energy. And so when we think about who has access to clean energy, typically we think about people that have means, people that um, businesses and corporations and, um, and public entities but what community solar does is offer a way for folks that can't either can't put solar on the roof, don't want don't want to put solar on the roof, to participate in clean energy, save money, um, and I'm really excited about the way that that is going to provide access to communities that don't often um, are are either marginalized or or don't have a disadvantage, and so I think that is a trend that I'm super excited about, along with the advent of um, electric vehicles. Uh, electric heat pumps and the like, um, and so the, the technology acceleration really is is what's driving a lot of this. And we're going to see so many jobs in the space, as you mentioned, Link, on the policy side, um, coming from both the uh, BIF, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, as well as the Build Back Better plan, um, Build Back Better um, Act. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I will pause there because I could go on for a long yeah. time. No, it's it's fabulous, Sarah. Um, I mean, what excites you and can you kind of intersect that with kind of your work on your 
in that DEI committee that you're on? Is there, are there things that intersect there that excite you um, in the industry, but also reflect kind of diversity inclusion work as well? Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, just to tag on to what Eric had mentioned, it is impossible to not be so excited about the entire industry right now, um, having been a part of it and, and watch the development of the technology, the pace of development has only sped up. And things are moving so fast right now that the capability of many of the technologies that we're working with to do different things for the grid is already way far out ahead of what our policy permits it to do. Um, so it's exciting to see energy storage come into play um, as a real viable alternative to a real-time grid that you know spreads itself across the entire country. I think that the localization of energy is something that can result from solar as well as the localization of the workforce to build and maintain that energy infrastructure. One of the things that has made working at All Energy Solar so special is that you know we all do live right here. Um, and I see my customers in the store, you know, my electricians that complete the project um, are all my Facebook friends and I'm watching them raise their children and uh, their children. And it's just kind of um, a very community based experience. Mm. Um, but in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion, that is something where the industry has struggled historically, you know, the root of the solar industry. Um, I think those of us that have been around for a while can feel comfortable saying that it's always been kind of a male dominated, a white male dominated field. Um, and seeing the great amount of support um, from, you know, the Eric Posse included, um, Logan O'Grady, our, our board director, or our, um, you know, the director of Mencia, uh, the owners of my company, there's so much um, vested desire and interest in creating a more diverse and inclusive workforce, which I think the more we start to talk about it has just incredible business benefits, but also the community benefits. Mm -hmm. Our community is diverse. Um, and so, you know, I think that we need to start thinking about how to better utilize the human resources right here in our community. Um, All Energy Solar has grown so fast. We have 200 employees, uh, nearly 200 employees right now, but we could have essentially double the amount of employees if we were able to hire more licensed electricians um, you know, we found that we have to actively build and train our own workforce because kind of the traditional, you know, um, labor training communities are not necessarily prepared to train electricians that are going to go work on rooftops all day. That's not really the, the norm. And so um, I'm really excited for conversations about how to take some of these traditional buckets that people have worked in, you know, historically uh, and, and see how to transition them to new types of work with new technology and um, types of work that will also include new types of people. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So let's keep jumping off on that. I mean, Nick, well, how has Excel been trying to kind of recruit and attract and retain diverse workforce within your organization and the work, particularly in this area? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. and. and um, I think, first of all, I wanted to emphasize, you know, a point that, that Eric has made already. Um, you know, yeah, there are specific ways Excel and all the other uh, energy players in this space are trying to specifically recruit um, women, people of color to, to be solar installers and to be energy efficiency uh, workers. That's great. That's really important. But Eric was pointing us to like, really, you know, uh, there's a much broader constellation of people who are all, as, as our companies become, you know, clean energy companies, they're all really part, part of that picture. So, um, and, and I think that's important to, to think broadly because, um, you know, there, there are, um, as we go through this energy transition, you know, there aren't as many jobs 
in uh, operating wind and solar facilities as there are in the power plants that are going away. And that's one of the, the challenges that, that Excel and others really have to, have to navigate. Um, but there are some, some um, uh, things that, that Excel is doing specifically around um, trying to diversify the workforce, both the people that ultimately become Excel employees and the people that are you know, building the solar which sometimes, you know, we're just purchasing the power. We're not, we're not those, those, those are sometimes uh, employees of other, um, you know, solar farm builders and, and operators. But um, just, just to mention a couple of the things that, that um, we've done that I'm excited about. One, one is the, the legacy program, which is like trying to reach into the, into the schools to, um, to sort of <clears throat> start very early building a career pipeline. Um, which really we think starts with just making um, making people. This is a program that's in several uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul schools, and making um, young kids, especially kids of color, just aware of the opportunity. They might they may not see clean energy as a as a career path that's really open to them or that can that can pay them a, a family sustaining wage as they grow up. So just creating that awareness early on. That's a really neat program that sort of goes into the uh, schools early to, to start educating students about those opportunities. Connected with that, we've done some stuff around externships with high school teachers that help sort of help them better understand what the clean energy career opportunities are so they can build those into their curricula and, and lesson plans. Um, a different example, and I just want to highlight Ling, just a few different examples because these all kind of operate at a different level, but one that um, I'll, I'll talk about a couple more that are exciting to me. We've proposed to the commission a program called Power Up, which is a, um, a, a proposed $4 million three-year um, clean energy sort of pre-apprenticeship program that would be looking at um, creating uh, apprenticeship readiness programs for, for women and BIPOC uh, individuals um, implemented together with the Minnesota uh, Department of um, Economic Development. Uh, employment and economic development that is starting with sort of classroom instruction uh, around solar, uh, you know, helping people with initial union fees, a set of tools, those kind of things, classroom, but then actually linking them into the opportunity to, um, to, to, to do, uh, get on-site training in our proposed uh, solar project at, at the Sherco site, which is, uh, will be the biggest solar project in Minnesota. So like trying to build that pipeline. So when we're at the point in a couple of years time of building that project, then, they, then we've got a, a, a chance for people to work on, on site. So that's an exciting one. Another exciting one, um, we're, we're partnering with the Center for Energy and Environment around a uh, energy efficiency workforce program under the Conservation Improvement Program. It's about um, training for people of color around uh, home energy audits, ins insulation, installation, all these sort of energy efficiency careers. Which and I think that that's a super exciting area because that's work that can only be done locally. That's work that is like addressing energy burden from both sides at once, right? Because it's making homes more efficient, which lowers people's energy bills and also creating incomes. And that's a program that's specifically um, around uh, BIPOC uh, involvement in energy efficiency. Um, and then the last one I wanted to mention. Um, just because I've been personally involved in it and I'm really excited about it is um, Excel has recently proposed something called the Resilient Minneapolis Project, where we are partnering with three um, BIPOC led organizations in Minneapolis around uh, what's basically um, climate change resiliency, improving resiliency to climate change through solar storage and microgrids and doing that at, in partnership with three BIPOC organizations that, uh, you know, that are really core to their communities uh, Sabathony, North Minneapolis, the Minneapolis American Indian Center. And a lot of those organizations, although the, the main driver of that project is resiliency and solar and storage uh, as a tool for resiliency, those, our partners are um, very active in uh, clean energy workforce development for, for BIPOC uh, communities. So that's one that, again, you know, it'll be implemented over the next couple of years. Uh, so it's, it's early to, to uh, it's early stage, but, mm -hmm. but that's one that I think is really exciting for us. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. We'd love to talk about how to bring those into St. Paul and in, in, in Ramsey County as well with you. Um, 
So Eric, maybe twofold, I, I'd love to give you a chance to kind of speak to, you know, how to diversify the industry, but I also, you know, wondering if you could kind of tail that with what are those skills that really, or attributes that really, um, you know, make someone kind of a candidate to kind of get into this area? And I know that can be very broad because we talked about there are so many types of jobs, but primarily for the jobs that you're kind of seeing a higher, high demand where there's some, especially diversity gaps, what would be some of those skills in those roles? So I know I asked you a lot there, but yeah. you wrote and, a book, so you can do it. <laughs> and, and maybe that's a good segue, right? So I, um, uh, covered quite a bit of this in in the book make, uh, making process and um, and so maybe I'll just start with transferable skills and so there's like an entire chapter multiple uh, chapters about how people and I'm, I'm selfish uh, promotion shameless promotion uh, drop the link to the book in the chat um, is uh, really understanding what you're good at and then um, it, whether that's a career that you're already involved in and then how does that translate how do those skills translate over to potential clean energy jobs? And I'll give you two examples. Um, one, when we started to do more um, solar farms, larger solar projects, uh, we brought in a gentleman uh, by the name of Evan Carlson, and he's now our kind of chief uh, real estate officer or their land, director of land acquisition. And um, he came from the oil and gas industry. And he, um, you know, the skill of, of, acquiring land for pipelines really does translate well to working with farmers and landowners to lease land for solar projects. Uh, very recently, um, we hired an individual by the name of Jesse Diamond, who came from the telecom industry and was permitting cell towers. So these are like things that, um, you know, we're taking uh, folks from some of these other industries. Uh, oil and gas is a great one because there, are, um, you know, is likely to be a, a decline in that sector. Uh, bring those folks over to clean energy. Just understanding where you're, what you're good at and what um, what the industry needs. In terms of um, what we look for when when hiring, I think um, passion is probably the number one thing, and I, I don't even I can't understate the importance of it because when you're passionate about something, it's going to show up both in um, you know the interviewing process, reaching out if you're going to do an, an informational interview or just showing that you've got this, uh, this initiative or drive. Um, adding to your resume simple things like you know 12 hour course on um, whatever it is that you're, in, you're interested in doing. Uh, reaching out and networking and asking for um, you know introductions. Those types of things really set you apart from people that are just pushing um, uh, resumes online, right? Um, making that that human to human connection so important in the space, and I think that that uh, alone is 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 the most important differentiating factor. Mm. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I, I'm going to go off script just a little bit because I see this great question and something that I'm pretty passionate about too. And I know um, you all probably can uh, speak to this, but you know, great opportunity around career pathways, right? But there's a great opportunity around career on like BIPOC entrepreneurship in this space, probably more than any other industry that we've been looking at lately, or at least, you know, definitely rival some of the other um, like tech or other ones that are kind of have a lot of founders kind of creating new, new tech, new areas and new growth thoughts. I mean, I'll just kind of throw that out there because I know I, I, that's kind of a, a tough question from the audience, but you know, any, are there capital resources? Are there pathways? Like, what 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 are what's happening in the entrepreneurial space? Any any feedback on that? Uh, we did just have a really exciting um, update in the last uh, state legislative session where Jemez Staples, one of our colleagues, was able to finally secure funding for his training facility in uh, North Minneapolis, and and he's definitely somebody gifted with the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, you know, it, it does still feel though, like there's not enough in that space, I will say. And um, the, the desire for more in that space is there, you know, the, the ability to support more entrepreneurs um, as they develop their businesses. But we're also still at stage one, you know, um, the, the industry itself still needs to become more diverse. And it, it almost feels like there's a need to look inward before we can start, you know, um, 
helping others to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, th that's my thought, Eric. Yeah, I think there uh, there's way more resources today um, than there have been at any point in the past. Uh, I'm thinking about a few different examples. Um, so uh, states and policy can really lead on this one, one great um, in, in September, uh, Illinois passed the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, and with it, about $80 million a year to support and foster um, diverse and eligible uh, contractors um, to, to help them get on their feet. The spend from, from, the, um, uh, from that program will definitely launch a new wave of, mm -hmm. of um, black and brown entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, locally, we have a group called Grid Catalyst, which is brand new. Uh, uh, incubator and accelerator program for uh, new startups. And um, they definitely, uh, the leader kind of the, of the parent um, organization there, a uh, guy by the name of Greg Mast, um, uh, passionate about this subject, also a person of color. Uh, and then I think about other accelerator programs in, um, in places uh, kind of across the country. Uh, now with this kind of virtual environment that we live in, we've got access to different programs that we never would have had uh, before where we'd have to pick up, you know, essentially our lives and, and move. Um, there's, a, there's a group uh, called the Clean Energy Leadership Institute, CELI, uh, C-E-L-I, uh, that is actually accepting um, applications for their uh, upcoming cohort next year. And I would strongly encourage folks to kind of to, to kind of look in, in that direction. And then finally, um, again, circling back to policy, the Build Back Better uh, mm -hmm. Act, um, as it's written today, will provide additional incentives for uh, marginalized communities and and development of projects in, in marginalized communities. And I'm really excited about uh, about that opportunity uh, as well. Um, and, and really a focus like really never before. Uh, throughout that bill on equity. So mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of tailwinds in this in this uh, direction and i um, really excited to see what transpires here over the next uh, two to three uh, years or more. Yeah, thank you. I think this is one of those fields where, you know, maybe somebody doesn't actually think of themselves as an entrepreneur, but they can kind of start on the career pathway and then there, there, there may be an exit ramp that makes sense, you know, once they gain some of those skills. So I think that's great that you were able to speak to that a little bit, that there are growing resources in this space and a desire probably for large corporations to work with some of these up and coming um, BIPOC businesses and startups. Um, so, you know, COVID brought out just kind of the illuminated all the tech inequities in our community, like to no end, right? We're sitting here all on Zoom, obviously have to know how to do that in order to engage. I'm sure your industry has continually been um, fast-tracked in terms of technology, just like every other one has, um, maybe due to COVID, maybe it was happening anyway. But um, Nick, maybe I'll start with you, like where do you see kind of automation going in this industry and what are those tech skills that, that you know, folks will need in order to be able to g get into these jobs in green, green careers? You know, Ling, I think that's that's a bit outside. I don't do much work on on automation um, okay. and, and those kind of things. I can certainly uh, try to try to look into that. I, I mean, you're certainly right. Like everybody's operating in yeah. a virtual environment now, and there there are things certainly that Excel has done to try to um, make more equitable access to technology around. Um, I, I I don't have the details of it here in front of me, but I recall as part of the um, in 2020, where we really ramped up our um, Excel Energy Foundation and um, uh, sort of outreach to communities funding of nonprofits. Some of that was around uh, funding um, centers where, uh, you know, in BIPOC communities just for access to technology. Okay. And I think that's, you know, that's obviously just a very kind of early stage step, but um, yeah. Yep, I, I can't speak to automation specifically, but I can yeah. I can look for more information on that. No, I appreciate that. Well, I think we're at time, but I'll, I'll let, you know, before I say thank you, like Eric and Sarah, do you guys have any thoughts on automation before we leave people hanging on that topic? Any thoughts? Is it, is it, are things changing? Are you, you have, is there more automation in installing things and solar panels and doing that kind of work right now, Eric? Are you seeing the acceleration there? Yeah, I, um, I can go quickly. I, otherwise I would have, uh, 
encourage uh, Sarah to, to hop in there. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it's all about streamlining. I mean, when we started, there was just, you know, we were doing uh, bookkeeping in Excel and like, you know, it's all this very uh, primitive um, stuff that we were, that we were doing. Uh, technology and the capital and the um, technology stack have really started to transform things. I think specifically um, in, in places where you have highly rep, rep, um, repetitive tasks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, um, yes, yeah, so I think you're right. The access to technology is really, you know, widening gaps um, when we're trying to close gaps. And, yep. you know, maybe I'd even turn that back around on, on, on you, Ling, or Bob to talk about, you know, some of the upcoming initiatives that the county has yep. um, and uh, on workforce development. Um, but maybe before that, I, I can kick it over to Sarah if she has a few thoughts there too. You know, there are some really, um, I think, fun things that are happening in terms of um, technology that is taking over the job of what people used to do. Um, mm-hmm. And it's actually making it safer. There are mm. um, a lot of people entering the industry with drone licenses now, which is, mm. um, you know, a, a technology that is hugely beneficial across many steps in the value chain. Um, you know, I think that having um, a number of people working remotely at any company requires access to computers and um, access to an internet connection. Um, you know, we uh, have provided computers and technology for our employees at All Energy. I'm sure other companies have. And so that, those barriers can be overcome. Um, and uh, all in all, the effort to complete the clean energy transition is going to be very hands-on and human. Mm. You know, the thing that makes it special is we are mm. going to have to build it. Mm. Uh, so it's not at, you know, it's not at risk of automation in some of the respects that other industries are right now. Is my yeah, that's super helpful. Yeah. Like that's kind of what I was trying to get at. Like, is, is that like impending, right? We tell people we're growing this industry and then quickly lots of the jobs are going to get automated. So thank you, Sarah. Well, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate your insights. Um, so right now we are going to take a little break, but I do need to do a commercial. You'll want to stick around because we're going to hear from our unions and trades and hear about all those career pathways. And it's a really unique opportunity to hear from all those folks. You can feel free to turn off your cameras and take a a short five-ish minute break. Um, But Rachel Speck from the Eastside Employment Exchange is also going to stay for some chat and trivia for those of you who, you know, have some stamina and can stay on and and work power through the break. So Rachel, I'm going to turn it over to you, but folks feel free to take a short break and we will come back together here at... um, let's see, 10, 17 or so. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ling. Um, We'll get started with trivia here in about two minutes. So go ahead and take a break if you need to. Um, We'll come back with trivia.
All right. So if you are interested, we'll do a little quick trivia here for you on the construction industry and green construction careers specifically. Uh, as Ling said, my name is Rachel Speck. I am the employer liaison working with the Eastside Employment Exchange or a collaborative of organizations working to connect East Side of St. Paul residents with better employment opportunities and more equitable employment opportunities. Um, so hopefully we're ready to advance to the first trivia question slide. There we go. Question number one, multiple choice, the annual average wage for construction and extraction occupations within the construction industry is A, 49,500, B, 61,300, C, 68,200, or D, 76,800. Yes, we've got a couple of folks who are already putting their answers into the chat box. So go ahead and put your answers into the chat box. We got a um, couple of folks thinking it's C, a couple of folks thinking it's B. Super exciting. Look at that. So we got some folks who guessed correctly. The correct answer is C, $68,200, which is slightly above the um, area median wage here in the Twin Cities. So that's um, great opportunities for folks there. Question number two, the largest share of future demand for green construction talent includes which of the following occupations? A, building equipment contractors. B, foundation structure and building exterior contractors. C, other specialty trade contractors, or D, all of the above. Oh, it's really exciting to see folks participating in trivia. Excellent. And we've got um, most folks that looks like are, are choosing correctly. It's D, all of the above. So third question is true or false? Construction careers include licensed trades, unlicensed trades, specialty trades, and general labor. A lot of folks guessing true. The answer is actually false. False, it is just the first three categories there of licensed trades, unlicensed trades, and specialty trades. We took all of our trivia questions from the Ramsey County Workforce Innovation Board report on green construction jobs. So if you're interested in learning more information, um, that'll come out. I believe it's also part of the program today too. So go ahead and check out that report for some additional information along with um, industry projections and, and patterns uh, to help you in your work. So thanks, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ling now. Yeah, thanks, Rachel, appreciate that. These are the parts of like the pandemic that drive me nuts. Like if we were in person, we would have given winners like candy bars or something, right? Like if we would have been, ha we would have had a donuts this morning and then we'd be looking, you know, be, Oh, but we're, we're glad you're here, even via Zoom, and hopefully you're, you're, you're tolerating the virtual environment. I know it's challenging. So thank you. Thank you again, Rachel. So to take us into the next section, I actually have the privilege of introducing Kate Prushek, who is the Dep Department of Labor and Industries Assistant Commissioner to Construction Codes and Licensing. Um, she's also over the Government Relations and Workforce Development Program. So hi, Kate. Welcome. Um, she oversees that area, which includes apprenticeship, dual training pipeline, youth skills training, which I am a huge fan of, and I, I kind of helped launch a program way in the infancy of that effort, um, legislative services and office of combative sports. All right, whatever. I, I didn't know that. So thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Ling. And that's always a fun fact. People don't know that Department of Labor and Industry oversees Office of Combative Sports. But yes, we regulate professional boxing and, and MMA. So, but we're not here to talk about boxing today. Um, I'm so thrilled uh, to have the opportunity to kick off our next panel. And just wanted to start by talking a little bit about 
some administration-wide priorities around climate change. So in December 2019, Governor Walls issued an executive order establishing a climate change sub-cabinet and setting a vision for the state to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, of course, we're not on track to meet our statewide goals, um, mitigate climate change, achieve resiliency, and do so in an equitable way, understanding that you know, climate change um, has had disproportionate effects on different communities. So that um, the climate action framework has six, six goal areas, and I just wanted to run through those briefly. And so it's a vision, the framework that we're working on is a vision to address climate change and build resiliency. So these goals include clean transportation, climate smart natural and working lands, resilient communities, clean energy and efficient buildings, healthy lives and climate equity, and clean economy. And I'm fortunate at Labor and Industry to be able to participate in two of these action teams that are organized around these goals, setting priorities and action steps to ac actually achieve the goals. So I get to be on the clean energy and buildings work group. And I really wanted to give kudos to the city of St. Paul and just put in a plug for work that the Department of Labor and Industry is already doing around buildings because the cities pushed us to do so. So um, the Department of Labor and Industry is in the process of rulemaking to accelerate our statewide commercial energy code to achieve net zero by 2036. So we are going to, we're going to be adopting the latest national model standard, ASHRAE 2019-90.1. And the city of St. Paul really you know, came forward and you're already doing such exciting work to um, make your buildings more efficient. So we really wanted to push the, the whole entire state and uh, accelerate the statewide building code. So kudos to St. Paul and thank you for your efforts and leadership. The second action team I'm on is this clean economy work group. And we talked quite a bit about whether it is exclusively new green jobs that we should be talking about instead of it's more the greening of existing jobs and understanding that so much of this work is happening in construction, right? So as we've been talking about our action steps, we not only want to grow green jobs through innovation and continue to green existing jobs, but also ensure that we're providing for an, equi an equitable transition because we're moving away from fossil fuels, which is going to result in displacing a lot of workers. So how can we upskill and reskill those workers for greener jobs. So I'm thrilled to introduce our next panel and I get to work with Rick Martigan. And Rick is great. I'm hoping as part of his intro, he'll tell you at least one fishing story because he tells them to me all the time. So I'll move on to Rick. Um, so I know, we're all, I know we're all looking forward to hearing directly from our next panel, career pathways into these green jobs um, at a family sustaining wage. So these are people who have great expertise working within our unions and trade areas, and they're going to able they're going to be able to tell us how things are going on the ground right now. To moderate this panel, it is my pleasure to introduce Rick Martigan. Rick has served as the state program administrator for Apprenticeship Minnesota at the Minnesota Department of Labor and, and Industry since 2015. Prior to his current role, Rick was the training director for the Craft of Minnesota and North Dakota. Rick was president of the Apprenticeship. Association of Minnesota. Rick began to work in the tile industry in 1988 after serving in the U.S. Navy, became a journey level tile work tile layer, and began his career in apprenticeship as an instructor in 1998. With that, I'll hand it over to Rick. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you, Kate, uh, for that introduction. I would also like to say that I grew up on West 7th Street. I, I am a West Ender. I grew up on St. Clair and Duke. Um, spent most of my life uh, in the in the neighborhood. So I'm so thankful to be here, excited to th and thrilled to close out National Apprenticeship Week. Uh, we've been celebrating our programs all week long with a lot of wonderful events. And uh, I couldn't be happier to be here today to uh, discussing the programs, some of the programs that we have 
and how they participate and uh, utilize green technology and learning more about each of the programs as we as we talk to them. I'd also like to thank Commissioner McDonald for his comments earlier and uh, nice to hear the story uh, as being a glazer. So with that, today's panel will assist us to understand the landscape of green jobs in our ecosystem in the region and understand how to access those career pathways. Uh, I'd like to thank Ramsey County, Ramsey County Workforce Innovation Board, the City of St. Paul, Governor, uh, Mayor Carter's office and his leadership team, and uh, the St. Paul Area Chamber for putting this program together. I have been uh, uh, working with, with individuals from, from the uh, Planning Committee and it's been a lot of fun, so thank you very much. I'm very honored to be uh, accompanied by our panel today and I'd just like to take a minute to introduce them. I'm, uh, I've had the honor of, of working with each of them. Dave Dressler, he's the Apprenticeship Coordinator for Limited Energy, JAC. Tom Oshheim, who is with Finishing Trades uh, Inter um, Institute of the Upper Midwest and serves also as the uh, uh, president of the Apprenticeship Coordinators Association of Minnesota. Uh, also, uh, Nathan Runke, he's with the International Operating Engineers Local 49. And uh, we also have um, our, our next guest uh, uh, with the, with the uh, uh, Local 633 uh, Summit Masons, and I don't see him on the Brian Farmer with uh, Local 633 operating, uh, uh, Local 633 Cement Masons and Plasters. Well, thank you very much for being here and joining us. I just want to start out with a brief explanation of uh, registered apprenticeship. Registered apprenticeship, for those of you who don't know, is a workforce development tool that combines on-the-job learning with related technical instruction, so our classroom portion of, uh, of that. And registered apprenticeship programs can be anywhere from one to five years long. And the, uh, they have wonderful wages and benefits. And the result after uh, a person goes through these apprenticeship programs is a nationally recognized credential. And so you can go to any any state in the United States. And um, when you complete your program as a journey worker in the occupation that you've trained in, you will be uh, recognized as a journey worker in that craft wherever you are. And so these credentials are portable and, and, and um, take an incredible amount of dedication and work to achieve. So uh, we'll hear more about that from our, our panel uh, as we go forward. So with that, um, I would just like to address uh, the individuals on the panel. Um, and we'll start out right with questions right off the bat. And I think what we'll do is talk to, uh, I'll just go in round robin. Uh, I'll start with uh, Tom Oshheim. Uh, please say a little bit about your program, about yourself and your role, and about um, how you're preparing apprentices for technology and the topic that we're addressing today, which is uh, green jobs. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everybody, for allowing us to participate in this. It's a great opportunity for the construction trades to be involved. So I am the director of technical education at our school. So we train everything from painters, drywall finishers, glazers, and glass workers, and then the convention and sign industry. So we do a lot of different things with the technology, especially on the green side. So for the glazers, the glazers are installing new types of glass so we can block out the sunlight we can change the atmosphere that's inside the room just by using those products on the paint side we're teaching them the new technologies and what paint coatings that they should put on for application they've removed a lot of the solvents and a lot of the different things as far as the green side of the technology goes for that and the sign program and convention workers we see a lot of different things that are coming up in those atmospheres that we're teaching to those apprentices. So we're always working forward to make sure that we're keeping on the newest technologies for the apprentices. 
Thanks, Tom. Brian, could you address that same question? Sure. Thanks, Rick. Uh, the biggest thing in our industry as, as a cement mason would be more so our mixed designs changing. Uh, the traditional cement as it was made uh, took a whole lot of energy to do. So we're, we're seeing a lot of industry byproducts that are recycled into our mixes, creating a less of a, a demand on, on Portland cement and a whole. But um, I mean, truth be told, our material is, is the most widely used material in the human race. And it, and it, uh, for, I mean, it's structural capabilities, all of our infrastructure. I loved seeing a lot of the pictures of Highland Park and these other, uh, these other builds and all of the concrete being utilized. I don't see that changing very long, but what we have to do as an industry is, uh, is figure out a greener way to, for our mixed designs and how cement is being, uh, made and processed, which is, is evolving big time. So we're seeing it in our mix submittals. Uh, a lot of our new builds are being specked out with fly ash and slag and, and a lot of these supplementary cementitious materials. So it's great to see that trend happening and educating our apprentices on the materials that we work with. Fantastic. Thank you. Nathan, could you address that same question, please? Yeah, for um, operating engineers, I mean, we're we're operating heavy equipment. So at the moment, uh, we haven't really started greening on the actual equipment we operate. That still tends to be diesel, you know, that that kind of stuff that we're running. But the projects we work on are continually becoming, you know, more and more of a mix of green. Uh, we're the crane operators putting up wind turbines, um, thing, things like that. Uh, and as solar gets bigger, you know, our... our our civil work will be involved in a lot of those projects. We tend to be involved in more uh, utility scale sized um, green energy projects, um, a little bit less in uh, actual in the city for some of the greening, but um, uh, that, that'd be a big part of where we're, we're working on it. Thank you. Dave. Uh, thank you, Rick. The limited energy world is really based upon uh, advancing technology. Uh, the, the whole go green thing is, is something we've been doing for years. Uh, the, the technology that's changing is, is things being powered from the network. So you don't need to plug into a network and plug into the wall. They're being powered over a technology called power over ethernet or power and data. So a lot of equipment, monitors, lighting, um, you know, things around the office, instead of requiring 120 volts power, that they consume so much uh, less power than they used to, they can be powered simply off a computer uh, computer cord. So um, just with the advent of all technology moving towards a lower power consumption, it would require less power generation. So we're constantly on the forefront of, of just seeing this new tech come out and really how it saves, uh, saves energy and requires less power generation. Thank you. I know all of your programs are on the leading edge of all technology and and new techniques to uh, to to build uh, the projects that are out there, and so it's it's really interesting to see what the what your industries utilize and and watching the training that takes place. It's it's very uh, interesting to see. I have a question that came through. It wasn't a part of one of the plan questions, but um, could you talk about the length of your program, and then how if someone's interested in in getting into one of your programs, uh, how would they do it and is there an entry level opportunity for someone to come out of high school or, or come just as an interested job seeker to gain access to your program? Uh, Brian, please. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, we're always looking for people. We don't really designate a time of year. Um, if, if people are interested, they can go to our website and I can put it in the chat. That's www.training633.org. The biggest piece on our end is we're not a hiring hall, so we need to get you sponsored or hired by a contractor to get in. Then your apprenticeship will happen. Uh, we typically train, like right now, uh, the energy in our, our training center is bursting at the seams, and it's just awesome. We have the most apprentices that our local has ever seen right now, which is absolutely incredible also. Uh, but we train from November till April, and each year group comes in roughly one week a month from, from uh, November to April, getting their 160 hours. Um, so pretty much, uh, yeah, I mean, just email us, reach out to us. There's always an opportunity. It's a little slow in the winter, 
time. Uh, our highway heavy side, which is our roads and bridges, curb and gutter, that typically ends around Thanksgiving. But our builder side, which is our you know stadium skyscrapers, colleges, hospitals, buildings, depending on the workload of that specific contractor, that could go and does go all year long. So just uh, reach out and, and give us a shout and I will put our email uh, on, the, uh, on the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, Dave, how about uh, your, your program, length of time and how do you access your program? And can you just, uh, how do you gain, uh, can you start from entry level? Uh, yeah, so we're a three-year apprenticeship program. Uh, we go to school for standard September till May, uh, one day a week. Uh, you work the other four days of the week. Summertime, you're off. Uh, as far as, and we're much like Brian, much like Cement Masons. We're not a hiring hall, we're, uh, so we need to get you hired and sponsored by one of the contractors. But um, I'll put our website uh, in the chat as well. You can apply online at any time. Um, there's no specific time of year that works better than any other. Um, it's an online process, so three o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday. Absolutely, you can sign up. Uh, right now, we have, we're have we a little slow right now. And typically, uh, we tend to get a little slow this time of year, but if people can apply at any time. We have openings. Contractors are always looking for entry-level people. Uh, I hear this a lot where, well, I don't know anything about X, or I don't know anything about Y, so should I still apply? Absolutely, and I'll, that's for all apprenticeship programs. That's the point of an apprenticeship program. We know you don't know. That's okay, that's what we want. We want to be able to train you. So I would encourage people to, you know, if you think you don't know anything, that's perfect. We'll, we'll help you out with that. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Tom. We are also the same and we are open year round for taking applications. So we always welcome anybody that's interested in any one of the trades to definitely come and take a look at that. And the same as the other guys, I will put our, website in there so if people are interested in learning more or want to actually fill out an application we'll have that opportunity but just like Dave said if you show up at our training center and you want to get a job we'll try and get you lined up with a contractor and the only thing that we really ask is that you have a good attitude with a good attitude we could take you to places that you never thought you could get to if you come in with a bad attitude I just have to get a job that's not gonna work for any one of the people that are on this panel. You have to have a good attitude, wanna learn, wanna work. So that's really what we're looking for. So we do also, we do the same three-year apprenticeship and they come into classes two days per month for us, only in the fall and spring. So May through September, they don't have classes at that time. So similar to everybody else. And then we have a PSEO program for high school students that are interested in learning about all the different trade activities. So there is a lot of good entry level possibilities for people that want to learn more. So thanks, Rick. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Nathan. Yeah, so um, our, our apprenticeship program is similar to what, what they were talking about. We do have to have you matched up with a contractor um, because ours will go all kind of off season. So the winter months, you'll be doing coursework. Uh, we set people up with uh, a tablet, that kind of stuff so that they can do extra work on their own time. Or if a, a course is online that we've, we've set up, they can do it from home to hopefully not. Our training center is up in Hinkley, Minnesota. So we, we don't have the local uh, connect for the training center like that. So we do a little more remote that way. Um, we, we do end up being at about at least a four year program to get through, um, but you are working through most of that four years for the full work season. Um, so you're, you're, you're earning your wages um, and we've added uh, what's a, a career pathway through um, the high schools locally are actually across Minnesota. Um, you can sign up and uh, get on onto that one at any of the Minnesota high schools. It's a virtual academy course that's uh four four programs are four classes long uh they can get credit for text uh tech school or through our apprenticeship program to kind of get them going it teaches them about what to expect in the trade um kind of and kind of like was mentioned you know the, the good attitude part I, I feel like to to be a good apprentice you need what, what you need to be a good employee anywhere you know you, you got to show up on time you got to ha have some effort and teaching yourself as well. You know, you, you need to want to learn the things you're being taught. Um, 
that that seems to be the biggest uh, stumbling block we find with people who don't do well in our apprenticeship programs. They they kind of if they show up thinking everything will just kind of happen to them, they're usually not going to be a, a great apprentice. Um, if they come in wanting to learn and wanting to grow, they they turn out really really well. So. Thank you, thank you, and and to follow up on that, thank you all for the, your answers. But just to follow up on that, um, I know there you have a lot of efforts to help apprentices uh, through their journey in apprenticeship, and uh, and and we'll talk a little bit about that. We have ten minutes left. And I want to uh, uh, cover two topics. One is. Uh, the new tools of, of the things that have changed, even since uh, I was in the field, the tools have changed so much. And then also uh, talk about what your organizations are doing to become more diverse, um, uh, to provide equity and, and be more inclusive for uh, for people to in your organizations. Uh, maybe Brian, could you could you talk a little bit about that, please? You're you're muted, Brian. Sure. Uh, so we really focus on our relationships with our community-based organizations uh, internally, and we, we try to participate in as many grant pre-apprenticeship programs as we can via APEX with the Department of Labor, with uh, MnDOT Deed and MnDOT uh, Tribes, which is a, a partnership with the different tarots in the state. They are phenomenal, phenomenal pathways uh, that we do up here. And I mean, not to hit any kind of marks because we focus more on retention than anything, but uh, just uh, doing life with these individuals and um, watching how, you know, them recognizing this career pathway is very viable, impacting their lives and watching their lives change. Are, it's just awesome. So it happens to just check all those boxes anyway, but the, the programs are designed so well. And uh, I mean, right now, I think we're almost 10% female as far as our apprenticeship body right now, which is just incredible. I mean, the stereotype of you got to be a strong male to do this physically demanding work and place concrete, this, that, and the other. We have so many phenomenal females in our industry. It's just, it's, it's awesome. So it's a great thing to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, Tom, I'd ask you the same question, please. Sure. So just like Brian said, we do a lot of similar things. We work through Apex grants. We do all of the community involvement stuff that we can do. But we do a lot of mentoring with the people that are in the field. So in the old days, the construction worker status was there was an all white male society and We've completely changed that. Our apprenticeship program, we're 47.9% diverse in our apprenticeship program, which is because people came in, they talked to other people, and they identified through those sources that they could do these jobs. So it's people talking to people that really help us. That's There's no secret to it. It's just people talk to people that they recognize and they can understand. So that's been a great help for us. On the green awesome. side of things, we do a lot of stuff with virtual reality so that we're not using a bunch of welding rod, we're not putting a bunch of paint into the atmosphere, and we're not putting people up on big equipment until they do some virtual training. So we use a lot of that stuff for our green side of things. Thank you so much. Uh, Nathan, please. Yeah, so um, I'd say for the diversity part, uh, mainly one of the uh, biggest things we do is we, we actually have an on-staff person that her entire, Jenny, <laughs> her whole whole uh, reason for being at our at our union is to diversify and, and get new workforce um, coming into our trade. Um, she's the one that has that uh, operating engineers pathway program that I was talking about, the four classes. So we can reach any high school student in Minnesota, and we're starting that in North Dakota because we cover a three-state area. Um, we're partners in the Building Strong Communities program, um, so that's a multi-trade apprenticeship preparatory program, so that one's helpful for us, and I know that one last year was over, um, that class was over 80% women and, and BIPOC community members, so it does really help us get people who weren't traditionally coming into our apprenticeship programs 
Um, they, we have a, we're, we're involved in the women building success, uh, are there a strategic, strategic partner with us? Um, we have a women's uh, group in our union to try and give new uh, apprentices and, and female members uh, a community that they can kind of talk about the things that might be more difficult on a job site uh, that they notice. Um, and then uh, we, we work with uh, the Five Skies and Indigenous communities, uh, our partner with them uh, to do an OE pathway uh, curriculum for adults wanting to get into the trades from, from different tribal organizations. So, and then the technology side, like you were saying that, I mean, ours has been GPS and, and just computerization of a lot of, like our guys used to, you ran your equipment by the feel, you know, on the, on the levers, on the pedals. And now, I mean, you're, you're learning how to run a lot of computerized equipment. So it does add to the training. Um, not only do you need to run the equipment, but you need to know how to run a pretty complex computer system on that piece of equipment now. So I'd say that's our biggest changes. Fantastic. And Dave, we have uh, four minutes left, but I want to I want to catch you on this topic as well. I, I probably won't take all four. Uh, as far as the technology goes, um, uh, the, the new tools, our, our tools change every 18 months or so. I mean, uh, a $60,000 fiber optic fusion splicer three years ago is probably, it'll work, but th there's a new one you need today. So our, our tools change and our contractors spend a lot of money keeping up on the new technology and the new tools, as well as our field technicians. Um, so it, it changes it literally about every 18 months to two years. We're buying, um, you know, some type of new computer widget for training. Uh, you're just doing your job. Um, and then as far as some of the other initiatives, um, we're affiliated with the Electrical Workers Union and NECA, uh, National Electrical Contract Association. They have a whole new DEI initiative they're going through trying to recruit folks into the industry. Uh, the IBW has several different uh, programs. The Electrical Workers Minority Caucus, Sisters in Solidarity, uh, Renew, which kind of targets some of the younger folks in the industry, uh, as along with, you know, in like some of the other trades we do, you know, work with uh, community programs like Summit Academy, OIC. Um, we just, you know, we try to get out to folks and just explain that, hey, this is a viable option. And quite frankly, one of the last paths to the middle class, um, the, the manufacturing, all that other stuff, that's gone. This is this is a, an extremely profitable endeavor for you if, if, if you just give it the time, if you just put the effort in, this is the way of the middle class. So, uh, we, we try to get out and tell everybody that. Thank you all. And I'll take the last two minutes to just say how privileged I am to work with each of you and all of our registered apprenticeship programs on a daily basis. The What you provide to uh, your apprentices uh, and, and your members is incredible. Uh, what you heard today from our four panelists is just really uh, scratching the surface of really the work that they do uh, with all stakeholders, with our community-based organizations, with our other state agencies, with our workforce development professionals, with city county uh, officials, and, and just a number of other stakeholders, business owners around Minnesota. And the work that they do is phenomenal. They're, they're professionals. The careers they offer are, are professional as well. When you come out of it, you are indeed a journey worker in the crafts that they train in. The technology that they work with daily changes and keeps up with what's happening um, in the world and especially in the green technologies as they are the programs that build our cities, our states, our nation. So I can't say enough how proud I am to be a part of the work that they do and be around them on a daily basis. Thank you so much for all your work and for what you provide. And uh, thank you for being part of the panel. If you would like to know more about any of the programs that are offered registered, through Registered Apprenticeship, you can visit apprenticeshipmn.com and you can see our website. It provides you uh, uh, opportunities to learn about the programs that are registered in the state of Minnesota. Uh, additionally, if you would like to check out the uh, construction trades, you can go to constructioncareers.org and you can look at all the opportunities that the, uh, the folks on the panel today represent. So it's uh, fantastic. And I thank you all for letting me be a part of this. And I thank um, uh, the chamber for allowing me to, uh, to do this panel. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Thanks, gentlemen. Appreciated your time today. Um, really great job. Um, 
So I'm going to summarize a couple things and then maybe we can even, um, you know, kind of exit into that chat room slightly early. But um, I was thinking about how important it is, especially for those of you who are here on the line who, you know, spent a couple hours with us almost who, who support job seekers or students. I mean, really, it's the person who taps you on the shoulder that tells you, I think you'd be good at this. I see potential in you. You guys know the power that you have in terms of redirecting and, and, and sort of encouraging people onto a path. And so I think the more we as a community and certainly as the county can help expose and share and leverage resources for you so that you can have more insights into these industries and the connections that you need in order to make those taps on the shoulder and make those referrals and kind of open a, a, a door, provide a warm handoff, um, those are gonna make a huge difference, particularly in this area, because we know that while the trades have been working a lot on diversity and inclusion, more work has to be done, obviously, in lots of industries, including this one. And there's a lot of potential here. There's, there's potential for, for closing disparities here. So um, I just really value your time today as trusted messengers to our um, community who um, COVID-19 has really disproportionately impacted employment outcomes for those who are BIPOC, those who are less educated, and those who are young. And in Ramsey County, the, that means more disparities. And so the opportunity to reskill and to reach kind of these middle skill jobs, apprenticeship is one of those wonderful ways. There's many ways, but it is one of those wonderful ways. I loved how one of the speakers talked about getting to that kind of middle middle class um, opportunity, which I, you know, as an immigrant myself, my, my parents came here when I was five, you know, that is the dream of, of most immigrants that end up coming to the United States and, and for many people is to enter into the middle class and to be able to feel proud about the work that they do. So um, I just really wanna honor you for your time today to learn. Um, it was our goal originally to go on visits today. This was a COVID pivot to do this virtual event. We had planned a bus tour. We were gonna go to Vimela. We were gonna go to some of these union places and we will do that. So, I mean, Ramsey County is committed to ensuring we're supporting our workforce professionals and educators to have deep industry expertise and knowledge. And so for those union folks here, we will be calling you and we will be coming by. So hopefully your doors will be open as soon as you know the pandemic subsides a little bit that you'd be open to a whole community calendar of opportunity for um, our, our residents to learn more about what you do. And to our business leaders today, thank you so much. If you're still on, um, you know, really amazing innovation, um, investments being made in our community. And it's all because of, of, of folks like you. So I wanted to end with a couple of, of thoughts around um, our green jobs report. Um, a few people have referenced it. It is on our Ramsey County Means Business website. I think someone will drop that into the chat. But, you know, uh, Rick, you probably know this, but, you know, Minnesota ranks really high in terms of apprenticeships in the nation. And we're really proud of that. So that's one statistic we can hang our hat on. And hopefully we can keep, um, you know, pushing that number um, latest, at least in our report, when it was ran last year, we were 15th in the state, you know, it's the 15th in the country. So amazing work, Rick. And thank you for being with us. Um, you know, over kind of a part time period that we had kind of sliced out during that report, there were 726 green construction jobs in the way that we defined it in that report. And, and many required on, um, only a GED or high school diploma. So we know that there's opportunity here and it's only gonna grow as you talked about um, these other infrastructure bill and build back better and, and resources coming to our community. Now is the time for job, job workforce professionals, educators, teachers, students to kind of get more educated about what, what, what this industry is, what these industries are about and how you can be a part of it. Um, and, and certainly the biggest you know, selling piece is average salaries are $72,000 a year, which is uh, almost 10,000 higher than other jobs in, in, in our community. And so um, if that isn't enough incentive, um, I, I, you know, I hope it is to sort of dig further um, there are some barriers that I think we as a county need to work on, uh, things like driver's license and other like uh, support services that people need. And we as a county are really going to be leaning into that in 2022. So stay tuned. We are actually, um, you know, um, have some opportunity to try to be that 
um, you know, trying to fill those gaps where other people aren't. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to do that for the community. And so look for more events like this from us next year. We hope to dig into other industries as well as continue down this path around the green careers, because this is, this is a big one for us. And I think we need to um, really um, come together, you know, around a common strategy about how we're going to take advantage of both the resources, but also um, not only bringing the dollars in, but that those dollars go to populations who've been, you know, have had the most disproportionate, disproportionate is impacts. I've been talking too long today, you guys. So anyway, I will close. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to the chamber um, for helping us. Thank you to the city of St. Paul, our workforce board. I see a few members still on. And um, I'm just gonna say a big extra little final shout out to Rachel Speck with the Eastside Employment Exchange. She is a great thought partner in the community leading amazing innovative work around new ways of thinking about workforce development. Thank you, Rachel, to you and your team. And then I'm gonna turn the last little bit of this event over to John O'Fallon. Many of you know John. John has, a, has been an industry leader in the construction workforce space for, for many, many years in our community and is a resource beyond Ramsey County. He's gonna host a, a, just a, a chat time for people who wanna ask more questions. Um, if you can stay on for a few minutes and have some interest, you know, and you were dying to ask some questions or wanna meet, is there somebody you've wanted to kind of connect with or, you know, John's a good resource as well. So I encourage you to stay on a few minutes if you can. So um, with that, um, thank you all for being here. We, you will see a big email from us on Monday with lots of, of links and info that follows up on today's events. And John, I just wanna publicly just thank you for the work you do on behalf of this industry and, and mostly in, on behalf of ensuring opportunity and inclusion for residents um, as, a, as, a, as a main value that you personally and professionally hold. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.